Welcome to Ohm Times TV, a division of Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting. Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's Face to Face with video series, where contributors to the No BS Spiritual Book Club, that is such a mouthful, um, 10 Best Spiritual Books Library share the stories behind the books that move them the most on their spiritual journey. And face to face with us today is Deva Pimal, a woman who is beloved throughout the world for her beautiful chanting of Indian Sanskrit mantras. Before we welcome Deva, I just want to encourage you to post any questions that you might have for her in the chat window, along with your name and location as we go through the interview. And Sharon will gather them and we'll share them later on. Deva, welcome. Hello, Sandy. Nice to see you. <laughs> Last month, as you know, we had the pleasure to sit face to face with Meeting who of course didn't follow the rules at all, <laughs> but whose interview was undoubtedly all the more fun for that. And I'm delighted to have you with us today to share a little bit about your journey and the 10 best spiritual books that have touched you the most along the way. And thank you for keeping your list to just 10 mm -hmm. books, which I'm fascinated to see definitely seem to have a theme running through them. Oh my God, I thought I, I, I could have gone more that way. I thought, oh, let's try. Let's try to bring some different things in there. Yeah, and we'll get to uncover that. I think it will soon become evident as we get through the first two or three. Um, before we do that, I'm always curious to know what the selection process was like for each guest. Was it an easy task for you or did you have to spend quite a bit of time thinking about it? Actually, to be honest, I, I have hardly any time to read. I don't read very much. I have so many books I'd like to read and I don't get to them. So I don't have that much to choose from. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. And you're not the first person to say that, you know, life is too busy. They're not reading as many books. Mm -hmm. So the ones they do read have to be all the more um, compelling, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start with your first one, which is... Um, Journey of, Journey of Souls by Michael Newton, mm. um, which was published in 1994. And he, of course, was, um, you know, one of the pioneers of the uh, life between life um, hypnotherapy uh, regression books. So tell us what it was about that book that appealed to you so much. Yeah, so I, I think that's also a theme that goes uh, through the whole selection is um, I think it's, I'm just really interested in in uh, Scorpio-like um, themes, you know. So it's death and uh, and those kind of dark, you know, dark and light, you know, like where, you know the mixture or where the lightness comes into the darkness or the light comes out of the darkness. Those kinds of themes. So ever since I was a teenager, I would read near-death experience books and stuff like that. And then somehow I'd I'd, um, I hadn't gone there that much until our friend Shamdas left his body in 2013, suddenly with an accident. And uh, it was a huge, uh, huge shock because it was the closest friend that I'd lost so sudden. And, and my other friend said, you know, like this book really helped me, this uh, Journey of Souls book. And it was like right up my alley. It's like what I would read anyway. Just, but it was just the right time that it came. And what I love about that book is that it's, it's, a, it's a scientist who didn't have any preconceived ideas about re reincarnation or lives in between lives. He was a, 
these are hypnotherapists who would help people get rid of pains or smoking or you know like very very down to earth themes and he stumbled upon a past life and somebody's regression because he couldn't figure out the the reason for that person's pain in this particular life and then suddenly he could do the research and he realized why well, it's really like there was really this battle in France at that point and this many people died and whatever so it really was true and then and then in another session he stumbled upon a woman who suddenly said I, I don't have a body you know but I'm surrounded by these souls that I feel so close with and I don't feel like with anybody that close here on earth and suddenly I'm home and I'm really feeling like wow so that that totally fascinated him and then he did these 7,000 case studies that make up that book and uh, basically he kind of created this map of what happens in between lives which seem to be pretty consistent across the board of people who he doesn't influence, that's what I like when he does the session, he doesn't say, okay, you're going to now go through the tunnel or you're now going to meet your loved ones. Or He really leaves it open to see what they say. And then they say things like they all come and see a library in the end and they see, you know, they go through there, they see their spirit guides and there's so many things that are happening that are congruent in all these descriptions. That is really, really very fascinating. And, and uh, for me, that... I, I can say like somehow ever since I read that book I I almost perceive my life here like from this viewpoint of the, of the beyond somehow like I see everything in the context of what that could look like in the beyond and 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 or would look or what I imagine it to look like you know I think I say this now for the whole hour that we are going to spend um all these books that I'm reading you can't prove them, you know, it could all be just total mind fantasy or whatever, you know. I, I'm totally aware of it. I have experienced none of it. I haven't had a near-death experience personally. I know somebody who has, like a, a really good friend, but I haven't had one myself. And um, so I just feel it's, it feels right. It makes me feel good. So that's enough, you know, like I might as well believe something that makes me feel good this lifetime. It brings good out in me, it brings out compassion in me, the way I see the world, it brings more compassion and, and understanding and, and uh, peace. And that's all good enough, you know, if, if, when I, if and when I, when I die, and I, none of it is true, it's also fine, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I know it's, there's not going to be heaven and hell, I'm not going to go to hell this much, I'm totally 100% sure about it. Yeah. And, uh, and and if it's all over, you know, which some people believe, it's also fine, you know. So I think I just want to say that once and for all, so I don't keep saying about every book, yeah, who knows. Um, I, you know, I love what you said, and uh, I'm a great believer in if it resonates with you, then you have to go with it, mm. you know, because that's, that's the ultimate authority, I think, you know, is your own gut. Um, and I love that book too, and I have had a couple of regressions, and they are interested. And I've actually regressed a few people as oh, well because really? um, I studied hypnotherapy. But yeah, I mean, they—you're right—they do give us more compassion, and they do give us um, a much bigger viewpoint. And I think we need that at times, especially at times like today. Yeah, I mean, that's where I really. Um... It just brings home that understanding again that basically this life is not meant to be like a smooth ride. That's not really why we come here, what we come here for. And we're really meant to experience all these different dynamics and it's not fair. It doesn't look fair in worldly human terms. It makes sense in the bigger picture and, and that makes, helps me understand, you know, and helps me have compassion and patience and and, uh, and also this feeling of, I don't know what the bigger picture is, so I can't judge it, you know, like yes. that person has to act this way, you know, because I don't know where they come from. I don't even know what their childhood was like, let alone their last life. Yeah, so uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we can't judge. And number two on your list, um, I love this one. I had the um, joy of interviewing Annie Kagan. It was the afterlife of Billy Fingers. How my bad boy brother proved to me there's life after death. 
Um, and that's a quite different book, but obviously it is presenting some of the same, you know, suggestions and beliefs and philosophies. Um, what did you like best about that book? I mean, the, the, the biggest insight, and I think that's basically the main thing that I took away from this book, is um, what I love about, about books and stuff anyway, I liked when they broaden my horizon and when they kind of um, uh, really like smash <laughs> belief systems, you know? Yes, yes, me too, yeah. Uh, and with that book, I was uh, I had this strong belief before I read it that um, it's very German and very kind of uh, <laughs> righteous or something. That if somebody is um, going through an addiction problem, they need to learn to get off that addiction problem, and then they have transformed that that particular you know issue, you know. And it's and and so this lifetime, if they don't get through that, don't get off the, you know, they might have to come back and and um, and do it again or learn a lesson again or something, you know. I really had this kind of like this is this is obviously something that needs to be healed and this is not uh, serving the highest good of that person and they obviously have to come through this and if they don't, then they kind of haven't have failed or you know, like I mean, this is a little bit black and white, but. A little bit in that direction so this book like opened that horizon that this her brother he was a complete I don't know loser in the sen the worldly sense he was a drug addict alcoholic didn't ever I think he didn't ever had a real job he was just until he was 60 when he was 63 when he left his body he just didn't get it together and didn't never came out of that you know cycle of addiction or whatever and there he is now coming from the beyond saying like he's a really advanced soul that that just needed that experience of chaos in that way and and what it does to all the people around him who see him go through that that, that he kind of gave himself to to be part of that dynamic that they could you know learn from it so basically just for me again was like how do i know so that's basically <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we do like to have our little belief systems, don't we? And then every now and then something comes along to kick us out of that one. Yeah, that that is a really good book. And I know so many people who've read it. So, you know, obviously it's it's a much more modern kind of tale as well, I think, which people um, like. And the very fact that Billy Fingers was such a bad boy. <laughs> um, number three. Dying to Tell You by Lisa, is it Najjar, um, who is an author, psychic, medium and speaker. And the subtitle is, I believe it is, What Would the Famously Dead Have to Say from the Other Side? And I haven't read this one, but I want to now that I've read uh, a little bit about it. So tell us what attracted you to this one. Yes, and Lisa is with us here today, I, I hear. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa uh, actually got in touch with us saying, oh, I, I channeled this book and I listened to your music while channeling and maybe you're interested in this book and I send it to you. So that's how I came to know about it. And when I read what, what, it, was this, what it was about this book, I thought, oh, I definitely send it, I want to read this. And so basically what happened to her is that, you know, um, Walt Disney came to her and said many years ago now, quite a few years ago, came to her and said, please let us give you, let us famous people who have passed on, give you messages that hopefully the humans uh, will listen to more openly just because it's us, because they love us or they, they regard us as special or whatever. And she was resistant, she didn't really want to do it. And, um, and I think it took her a year or two and she was resisting. And then they suddenly just started coming. So all these different famous people including Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, um, Marilyn Monroe, Abe Lincoln, John Lennon, George Harrison, Einstein, you know, they just came. And, uh, <laughs> and she was so innocent that she sometimes didn't even know either that they were famous or that they had died. And for example, Waylon Jennings came and uh, she didn't know that he had left his body. And, and she said, I didn't even know you were dead. <laughs> as dead as they come <laughs> anyway so 
so I, and and each one has such a uh, different take style flavor and focus each message you know some are very personal of their personal regrets of personal transformation or or not transformation or whatever and and some have really have their mission or something they really want to bring across which is also very much in line with what their lives were like you know that same mission or so um, I just they're like they're like nuggets you know they're like um, I call them prey lines or something you just take one and you just savor it and you just mm. like oh that's so beautiful and yes. and in that book, you know, Mark Twain and George Harrison mention our music <laughs> because she was listening to it while she was uh, channeling them while they came through. And uh, and uh, they they said, I think Mark Twain said, uh, that's beautiful and complex music to the Gayatri Mantra and also George Harrison. So we can and we can use their endorsements. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, put those on your website. Mark Twain loves my music. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, I, I noticed I had a quick look at Lisa's website and I saw um, a couple of notes that said, find out why Albert Einstein changed his theory to the theory of irrelevance. Oh, Steve yeah. McQueen would give anything for another shot at living. Elvis Presley now resides in the Heartbreak Hotel and Davy Jones is still monkeying around. Yeah, I actually, I don't know, I, I thought I... Uh, yeah, I have like, um, like for example, this is from Martin Luther King. Each one of you is a sacred messenger of peace. Your hands are the hands of the masters. They need you to do their work. In you, it is done. So, you know. That's so. beautiful. I was going to ask you if you have a favorite. Is that your favorite? Mm, Elvis Presley, I really love. Um, I don't, I don't know. I just, there, there's. Elvis Presley is really beautiful, but um, there's many, many beautiful. Hmm. Presley, a little bit of Elvis Presley. Yeah, tell us. Make a difference in the world. It doesn't have to be the whole world. It can be one person because that person is the world. If you could see from down there what I can see from up here, you would do kindness all day long. This kind doing has a vibration that circles the world, the entire world. Can you imagine what the world would be like if each of you did kindness? And that's really like, I never forget that. I just really see these vibrations, you know, always, um, you know, swirling around and, uh, and never ending, you know, like they're, they're always there. So, uh, mm. so very, very that, that is a, it's a very simple message and a very profound one. Mm. and beautiful too. Yeah, very basic one, fundamental. We all yeah. need to pay attention. Yeah, in a different, you just need to hear in a different context, a different yeah. word, and it goes in. Yeah, yeah. So number four, wow, that was an interesting one to research. Bridge over the river, after death communications of a young artist who died in World War One, And Botho Sigwart, <laughs> Earl of Eulenburg, um, yeah, I mean, he died in 1915 when he was about 30 years old or somewhere around there and started sending messages to his sister. That is a hard book to actually track down. And I did manage to track a copy down online and I did manage to look at, you know, um, there's loads and loads and loads of links. You can download the whole thing yeah. in individual chapters. So how did you find this one? That somebody gave to me at a, in, a, in a concert because now in our Sangha people know that I'm into this. <laughs> I get so. This is the book. I have it right here. It's uh, it's pretty unattractive looking, pretty kind of, and it's thick. And I didn't even want to really, you know, it's just some something somebody left, and I thought I must be can't read it. I don't have time. And then I and then I looked closer, and then I saw what it was. And so it's this musician who lived from 1885 to 1915 and died in World War One, And he was actually quite uh, quite successful in his short life as a musician. He was a composer and a, and a wunderkind kind of piano player. And um, and he, he left his body in the war. And then, like you said, he came for 30 years. He, he gave messages to his siblings and his sister-in-law, I think. 
and he came through like and he keeps kind of saying this is not like automatic writing it's a different process and he always says it's a kind of a more advanced process how they receive the messages and it's I, to be honest, I haven't even read it yet. It's still, I'm still only halfway through because I, it's just such uh, so potent. I keep underlining things, and uh, it's the thing is, it's written in German, obviously, originally, and it's kind of old German. So I don't even know if it sounds that great in English. I have actually chosen one or two things to read, um, but you know that could be a little bit off turning, but. Um, but uh, what I just love is that he is, first of all, he's a musician, so he's, he's saying that this is a really beautiful thing. He says um, about music, the chief purpose is to, con because he says, you know, I'm here now creating more music and I'm, I'm creating the symphonies and they're very for a certain purpose, you know, they're, it's not entertainment, it's not just to listen to it, it's for a certain time to be performed or played or created. And he says, the chief purpose is to conduct the attitude on earth onto a different course. This music is distributed into the most diverse spheres surrounding the world and its influence is enormous. Perhaps you cannot properly comprehend that humanity is to become, in, we become more inspirited through music, but it is so. Music is the highest art. It alone can have an indirect influence on a person. He never knows or hears anything of it since his earthly environment fills him entirely and yet he must listen to this voice all the same. So anyway, just uh, just all these different perspectives or, or you know, the, the levels of, of um, you, you really, that, that's what's so special about this book because he started one month after he left his body with the messages for 40 years. So you actually get to see his whole um, development like when he first leaves his body he says like please don't think about my physical body it physically not it, it, not it physically but it hurts like it, that's that's what gives me pain when you give all this attention to my physical body that's that's dead and uh, you know please see me as a spirit being and then later he will say oh now you can do whatever you want with my you can think about my physical body it doesn't I'm now advanced it doesn't doesn't affect me anymore you know things like that so you see oh yeah now I've uh, entered a different level you know so that's I find it very intriguing and uh, yeah, I mean, you know from the series that you and Retin did with the medicine of mantra and you know anyway how much music influences us but it's really interesting to hear that he said this uh, you know more than a hundred years ago um, and to think that there are compositions being created that are actually going to be like um, transmissions that are going to impact us in the future as well. I mean, that's quite astonishing. That's a book that would really interest me because there's things I haven't heard before. Yeah, I can send you, I have downloaded all the PDFs. I have, I can send it to you. Nice. Yeah, and I did, I did read a little, you know, I opened up a couple of the uh, links and I did read that it had been translated quite well um, into English. You know, the, the language may be a little bit archaic, but, it, you know, mm. it, it's understandable. Mm. Yeah, that really does sound like one that, yeah, you have by your bed and you take months and months and months to absorb it. The, the first year is actually in print in English that you can actually buy as a book, but not the whole 40 years, you know. Wow, what an undertaking too, to publish all of that. Amazing. Okay, number five, The Wheel of Life, A Memoir of Living and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. That was published in 1998. And of course, this was her story about her life, um, how she lived. Um, and um, everything that she accomplished in her life and what she's learned, giving us a lesson too. Um, so tell us about that one for you. It's kind of a little bit almost getting boring, the old death. <laughs> like <I'm> not... <laughs> no, everybody knows that it's, you know, mostly about death now. And I think it, it, what's interesting is you are picking so many different kinds of books about death. But it does make it interesting because we're getting different angles and perspectives. 
Mm. Mm. So um, the reason why I read it is because we actually met Elizabeth and uh, she was already, she already had had, uh, I don't know how many strokes she's had by that time. We saw her in Arizona in her house and uh, a friend of ours was friends with her. He brought us to see her and she was grumpy as usual. He's, she's known to be quite, she was known to be quite frank and quite, you know, a bit like that. And um, first she didn't even look up and she said, yeah, you can sit there, but you do, you know, she was just watching television and we were sitting by the side and nothing was happening. And then Yuten just took his guitar out and started playing, you know, just, and we just started playing with each other singing and and then she she turned the television off and started listening and then she was really she was really into it and we sang Shima and Shima she loved because she was so connected to the Hopis and the Native Americans and she actually then asked us whether we would sing that at her funeral and uh, and we saw her two or three more times also in the old people's home that she was and and where she also left her body she is uh she was an incredible character of no fear i think that's what i really took from that book she had no fear you know she was so herself and she didn't care if she was liked or not liked and she was with her strong swiss accent that she kept although she lived in america for i don't know lived in america for 50 years or something that was kind of really like she was had she had a bit of a hardness about her, like a little brash, but full of heart, totally there with a compassion and real, you know, like the way she met people who were dying or, you know, she was she was just real with them and not, oh, you know, poor thing, you know, she was just like, yeah, I, I hear you and I see you and, you know, like, and I'm with you in whatever phase she she created those five phases of yes. and all that. So this book is incredibly entertaining. It's amazing what happens in her life. I had no idea she had this whole thing with her spooks, uh, you know, these spirits that guided her. Did you know? The, you know, like this. It's a, it's a really good read. So um, it's just very inspiring to read of somebody who's so fearless and and. Uh, and into death so that <laughs> and 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 you know did such a wonderful thing for humanity as well you know because we need to talk about death it's part of life yeah. and we don't you know we're all so afraid of it that we avoid the subject so you know thank god for her yeah yeah she it's a sad she just it took a long time to die and she was not happy with that she had like she was really not happy with having to live through another stroke and another stroke. And when she left her body, eventually we, we, we were so wanting to be there for the funeral to somehow fulfill our promise, but uh, it was just not, we were just booked. You know, we had a whole week. Oh, that was a shame. Oh. Yeah. Um, I don't suppose Lisa Najar has ever, uh, she's ever come forward, has she? Come forward as what? Uh, to speak to Lisa and oh. pass on any messages. That's a really good point. That's Lisa will have to tell us. <laughs> Put that in, in the... <laughs> okay, so let's move on to book number six, which is Dragon Thunder, My Life with Chogyam Trungpa by Diana Mukpo. And um, this, is, this is published in 2008. And she ran away from a high upper class English family at the age of 16 to marry a young Tibetan Lama, um, you know, which I can just imagine as far as the upper class English are concerned, <laughs> that is an absolute no-no, especially at 16. So um, tell us what you know about this book and how it impacted you. I mean, I just basically just read it because I was attracted to know more about uh, Chögyam Trungpa. And ah, you say it better than I do. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. But, um, and I, as you might have noticed in my choice of books, I'm not very philosophical. So there's not really any books that are very, uh, very unpractical. Like I need a, like a story or something, you know. So, um, so it was nice to read a book about him and about the life, which was then it's a reflection of what he was like and 
And there's, you know, he was very known for his sexual um, freedom that he took for himself. So that was intriguing for me to know about because he was just really um, completely open about it and had and didn't hide it. And and also he was a alcoholic. He was more often drunk when he, you know. So he was this one of these crazy wisdom teachers, which Osho was and Gurdjieff was and. Um, and so it was like, how was it to be married to him? And so that that's, for me, that was very, very, it's just a very, yeah, opening. What did, what did you make of um, the wife? I think she just did her best, you know, and it's, it's, I think it's just hard anyway to be married to a guru and then to one who has lots of lovers, you know, but she did mm -hmm. great and, uh, and, uh, and she had four sons and three of them were declared as um, the reincarnation of high Tibetan lamas. Yeah, you know what, it's a little while ago, so I can't really go into details about that. I don't know, but I think, I, I don't know, I, I read it and then didn't really follow much up. But, yeah. but, but just the, the um, just what I just loved is that the, the, the openness and the, that spirituality and this high spiritual person can be, can have those two sides and they, and they fit in some magical way together and they give each other juice and spice, you know? I think that's something that really we should, you know, as a society explore a little bit more because we're all so shocked when a spiritual teacher or a guru appears to behave like a human being as if you know they should be above and beyond all that which is completely ridiculous um so i would think it would be a fascinating book to read mm -hmm. mm. so number seven dinner with osho intimate tales of two women on the path of meditation by savita brant yes. um tell us about that one because i mean obviously osho you know intimately having yeah. spent so much time with Osho. I don't know Osho intimately that's the thing um, because I, I never met him personally I've you know I've sat in his in his darshan in his discourse I was there you know he was there in the front but I've never had a talk with him. Oh you I didn't know, know that. Oh no, I had no personal connection with him so um, so for me this book was so so that's also why I didn't really put an Osho book because what I've all the teachings I've received from Osho I, they were always uh, in out in audio form you know like his discourses either while I was there or or you know um, audio files but uh, I haven't really read many like books Osho books from A to Z because you know it, it's just um, just it hasn't happened but this book. Um, I love because it gave me such a personal insight into Osho, how he was on a personal level and also his, his, so there's two things about this book. It's, it's actually two sep completely separate stories of Indian women who were with Osho uh, from like 1968 on, like before he was known, before he had any disciples, before, you know, he was already a professor and he was already enlightened but he wasn't he was just uh, you know starting to travel and and both of these women one of them was really in love with him like on a very emotional level and the other one was a, also a professor or scholar of some kind and she was it was an intellectual uh, connection they had lots of discussions and stuff and uh, and especially the one who was in love with him emotionally he was also he seemed to also feel feelings he said I, I, I have a love for you that I feel for no other or, or something he there's a quote so he also felt it and the way he um, just the way he uh, lived it so gracefully and so clean and so but not suppressing anything and totally like um, you know she was you know she was really attracted to him as a as a man but she was married you know and so finally, so now she's actually, um, it, it happens that she's in the same room with him at night, you know, that she stays with him overnight. And, and, uh, and 
they think they're going to make love and then she she just can't because of her conditioning and because of her husband and it just doesn't feel right and although it's totally not happening happening with the husband he doesn't love her but still um and Osho is very totally okay you know it's like it's absolutely this and it's just um i'd never read something like that or heard something like that about Osho. there are no there are no women who come forward and say oh i have had sex with Osho or you know, he, he he's known as the sex guru, but actually he doesn't have any, or maybe because of that, he doesn't have any scandals himself because he didn't even ever say that he was going to be, that he was celibate or that it, that, that was the way to be. Mm. So it's very clean and very, uh, just these little sentences, these little talks, the, the teachings that he imparts on these women by the way he, he is or he, he they are together or by the way their lives he, or he, he guides them is very inspiring because it's 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 practical you know it's like oh yeah that's and it's in their women and then also to get the insight into uh, life of Indian women in those and like they were so courageous early 70s you know and then they wear red clothes and they wear a mala with Osho's picture on their neck and they're in some village or city in India you know they were also crazy you know seen as crazy and how that you know and uh, so it's very it's very beautiful i really really loved it, it just came out just like, like a year or two ago and one mm. of them, her body now one of the, the women but the other one she's still alive and uh, it's the first time that um that that uh, this is written down you know that osho was also a sexual being and had maybe a sexual relationship with somebody although he had a consort and we know that they were really lovers for many years that was never but she never wrote anything about it or she you know so it's um it's uh it's beautiful yeah and the reviews say that um savita does a wonderful job of telling the stories of these two sexually repressed women who transcend to become true devotees and apparently she reveals translations of osho's talks that have never been printed in English before. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to know what Osho's early days were like, this seems like a really good book to get. And it's not available on Amazon. I couldn't find it anywhere, but it is available from uh, dancingbuddhas.in, a website, you'll find it there. Um, so- Amazon Because I thought I saw it there. But you I saw it there? It's funny because a couple of the books that you, I really had to hunt, you know, to find where I could get some research on them. They didn't show up um, at, you know, two or three tries on Amazon and a few other places. Okay. Um, but I did find this one at Dancing Buddhas. Okay. Um, so anyway, but yes, by all means, you know, try Amazon first and see. Um, I thought, I thought I heard Mitin say when he was talking to us a month ago, that you had lived at Osho's ashram since you were 11? I was with Osho, I, was, I became a disciple of Osho when I was 11. And uh, I, but I was still living in Germany, going to school. Ah, okay. Weekend, so you weren't actually living in India at the ashram. That's why I thought that you knew him really well. No, at 17 I went for the first time and then I lived there for three years and uh, and then for ne for ten years on and off, but but I was just one of the many people. I wasn't. I didn't have a personal connection. Right. Okay. Um, so number eight, the gift by Haviz, and it's translated by Daniel Ladinsky, and this book was chosen by Elizabeth Gilbert as one of her ten favourite books. So um, you're in great company there. Tell us about this one and its impact on you. Yes, I mean, Hafiz is a Persian poet, uh, I always forget, I think 13th or 14th century poet. Um, he often is uh, named in the same breath as Rumi. And uh, Rumi is so famous and everybody knows Rumi, but and Hafiz, I think, is now also becoming more and more known. But for some reason, Hafiz uh, uh, speaks to me more, even more than Rumi. Somehow it just, it just, it just lands. And uh, Daniel Ladinsky, he, he made these uh, translations quite modern. So sometimes that's a little bit, it's a bit kind of, uh, 
I think it's it's mostly really good. The other day there was one, it had sandwich in it, and that was a bit kind of funny for me. But um, <laughs> but I just have to read you this one. It's called Tripping Over Joy. What is the difference between your experience of existence and, and that of a saint? The saint knows that the spiritual path is a sublime chess game with God and that the beloved has just made a fantastic move. That the saint is now continually tripping over joy and bursting out in laughter and saying, I surrender. Whereas, my dear, I'm afraid you still think you have a thousand serious moves. Mm. So it's mm. just, you know basically saying the same, the same message, but in beautiful poetry and beautiful imagery and uh, yeah it's just uh, it's also one of those you can just read one poem and just yeah um i was intrigued when i read that daniel ladinsky has said that his work with Havis is an attempt to do the impossible to render light into words to make the luminous resonance of god tangible to our finite senses wow yeah. what a task Okay, so number 10. Now this is quite different than everything else that has gone before. Um, the sun does shine. How I found life, freedom and justice by Anthony Ray Hinton. New York Times bestseller, Oprah's book club, mm -hmm. 2018, winner of the 2019 Moore Prize, finalist you know, for uh, the Dayton Peace Prize 2019. Tell us about this book, which I can imagine I haven't read it, but the little I've read about it makes me feel that this is this is something that's going to touch you on a really visceral level. Yeah, I mean that I did actually hear from Oprah, but I don't follow Oprah very much because I don't I don't watch that so much. But uh, but I did hear her talk about this, so that's how I became aware of it. And it has the the uh, the prison. That's, you know, like that's the Scorpio in me again that is intrigued and to know more about that. So it's this beautiful being, this guy called Ray or Anthony Ray, is it? Um, who gets put into jail for 33 and a half years for a murder that he didn't commit and he couldn't even have committed. I mean, his, his uh, ali, ali, how do you say? Alibi. Alibi strong he was nowhere near that person that got killed and and it was obvious and had all the evidence and just because he was black and he was poor and he was in the south and and uh and it took i think 18 years till he found a lawyer that really was totally behind him um and who had also had many other people and then it took another 12 years for that lawyer to get him out like even though he was totally and it was it just breaks your heart that's part of the story but he um you know initial of course anger despair um first you know like shutting off like being like basically suicidal you know from that phase pretty quickly he he realized he could help people actually first he realized that he could just have this total kind of uh, uh, freedom in his mind and how he could travel in his mind anywhere. So he started having relationships for five years with Sandra Bullock or Hilary Swank or whatever, you know, broke up with one and but then for five years he was with the other, you know, like really long, big, huge dream worlds that he traveled in. And then he, he realized that he could help prison, the other prisoners and um, created this book club in, in, in prison. But then also all these incredible um, transformations for a guy from the who was from the Ku Klux Klan to become his best friend, you know, who was, you know, things like that. So, you know, not seeing each other first, I'm giving away too much away here, I'm so sorry. Um, but anyway, it just is so touching how he, he how compassionate and, and uh, and also when you see him now, he's just, there's no bitterness or no anger, or it's just this, it seems like a compassionate being. And, uh, and to lose or to, 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 to sacrifice 33 and a half years of your life. But then again, that was the experience that his soul chose, you know, and that he most probably signed up 
happily for before he came and said, let me do that. I'm going to take that part, you know, a little yeah. you know, and, uh, and how much he can transform with that now, you know, how many people's, how many people's lives and bring compassion and, and uh, so, yeah, so it's a good story because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a real life story and it's very, very humbling, my God. It's very humbling. You know, and I've just realized as you're speaking there, you used a word that tells me that, um, you know, we started off saying there was a theme running through this and it was, you know, death and the dark and the light, um, etc. But really, it is about transformation, isn't it? Every single book, you know, there's something, somebody has transformed in some way in every single book. I mean, if you have a spiritual book club, I don't think you can get away without transformation in your book. That's true. That's true. That's true. Absolutely. So, so maybe it's not just death. You know, maybe it's this this Scorpio. I mean, Scorpio is about transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I think that is one of the. Um, you know, I love every single list that I get because I'm always, wow, look at this one and gives me an insight into the people. Yours was a real surprise for me, mm -hmm. but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And I'm going to get some of these books. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to do, because I know that we are a little bit tight on time tonight, and I'm sure there's people here who want to ask you questions. I'm just going to very quickly ask you two things. One is, that we always ask our guests to come up with uh, a few keywords that describes them. And obviously most people put, you know, what they do for a living. I'm a musician, I'm an artist or whatever, um, an author in, you know, the sort of thing they'd put in their bio. But what I'm really looking for are those little quirky, personal, humorous things that someone might describe themselves as, or your best friend might say, oh, you're such a tree hugger or something like that. Are there any keywords that you would give us that tell us a little bit about who David is? Oh my God. Uh, I, would just, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, love comes and I don't know what, what we have. We want to package love, love and, uh, and uh, twinkle in the eye and, uh, and the sense of, wonder and and a little girl <laughs> but i couldn't put it in a sentence or in one you know in one word. okay you don't need to put it in a sentence we just put it into uh you know we'll put it into a few nouns there um a few descriptors of you i oh. love the i love the little girl and the innocence that goes along with that and the other question is if you were asked to recommend just one of your books to someone who is looking to pursue a spiritual path, to open their mind a little further, which out of these would you recommend? Just one. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it would be Journey of Souls because then they wouldn't be able to stop <laughs> after that. <laughs> Because this, the, the Siegwart one, this one is so amazing, but uh, maybe it's too much for the beginning. So, uh, so yeah, so maybe. Start with Journey of Souls. Well, that's going to take you to a place where you have to see the world differently. Um, and you're right. You said at the beginning, you love books that stretch, you know, shift our perceptions, shatter beliefs. And that one would certainly do it. Good one to start with. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Well, what we're going to do now is open it up for questions. Um, we have about 11 minutes. Um, Sharon, have you got some questions for us? Let's see. Yeah, I, I have one that says from Jane, it says, I love that you said, look for the practical in your book choices versus the philosophical. Can you say more about that? Yeah, just that I, it just, I just don't have a philosophical mind that much. So, um, I space out kind of when I read to theoretical books. I have read one that's called Disappearance of the Universe, Gary Renard, mm -hmm. which was really, it's a big book and I somehow made it all the way through. It was kind of on the edge of that and, uh, and I was so close to putting that. But um, 
but uh, it just doesn't keep me there. I just I I've judged myself for it that I'm not philosophical enough or or, or I don't know exalted enough or whatever the word is. But it's just I'm just very just like like that little girl, you know. I just need something that I can feel like a, and I think it's it's maybe a little bit like. You know the stories in India with the gods and the goddesses. You know that's all packaged in beautiful stories that keep us engaged and and uh, are easy to remember. And it's not like a treatise on the qualities of Ganesh or something, you know. But it's a story that then helps us, you know. So that's my my pathway. It's not everybody's, but for me that's the. You know, I don't think you do have to be philosophical. I mean, you're a Scorpio. I wouldn't expect you to be philosophical. You've got that, you know, that Taurian balance there that you're somebody who just wants to get into it, into the practicality of it and, and into the fundamentals of it. Just for the Akashic Records, I'm uh, Aries with Scorpio rising. So it's the oh, Scorpio rising. Okay, well, yeah, that's how you appear to the world. Yeah, Aries. Mm. I don't think Aries are particularly philosophical either. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, don't beat yourself up, up <laughs> over that one. I wouldn't. Um, Sharon, any more? Um, I know Anna, Anna Liza wants to ask questions for her to type it. Yeah. I don't know whether Lisa wants to make a comment as we brought her name up a few times and one of her books is in your list. Um, Maybe she can go away and see if she can get a conversation going with a few people <laughs> we might like to hear oh. from, like Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Yes. Uh, Anna, Anna Lisa. Sorry, I'm not trying. Yeah. Anyway, dear um, De Deva, which book or writings inspire you? Do you get inspired while while you read? Sorry, I don't get the question. I uh, um, I thought I was just talking about the book. Yes. Yeah, I think I think to a degree where you were. Is that an earlier question that was posted before? Um... In your music, in your music. Oh, in your music. Yeah, that's somehow I. I it's kind of a bit of a separate world somehow. I think the, the music that happens, you know, with um, in the music and with Miten playing with Miten, and it's not that I that I have insights while I read or anyway, I haven't even composed. I'm really not a composer as such anyway, a music composer. So those two words, the, what I read hasn't really consciously um, affected the music that I, I, would, I would be aware of it, you know, but obviously my whole life is, is um, I live with that, with those glasses on. I feel like I think about death or I feel death all day long. You know, like it's just with me all the time and um, in a really nice way. I, I always like to say I'm passionate about death. I think it's just going to be such a great gift for all of us <laughs> to look forward to. Mm. When it happens. And, uh, and yeah, so it definitely will come out in my voice it will come because it's just me, you know, but it's not a conscious, it's not a conscious thing. Do you play music when you read? No, I cannot. I can't. It's difficult for me. Like, mm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I can. I can't play music. I, I can't play a song. I can't play anything with words. But I can play, you know, chanting or just music. If it's got words, it's too distracting. Mm. So I think we may have another question there, Sharon. Sharon, have we lost you? Sorry. <laughs> um, Lisa said she would talk to you. Do you want me to unmute, unmute her? Or do you want to have her ask a question? Lisa, uh, fine. Are you okay with that, Deva? Great. Lisa, yeah, sure. Unmute Lisa. Um, we've got a couple of minutes before we have to bring it to an end. But um, by all means. Okay. 
mute her just one second. Um, Actually, Lisa and I are going to do a Facebook live okay. talk next week where we're just going to have open the space for somebody to come through to shine light on to whatever it needs to be. Shine wow, is, is that going to be on your Facebook live page? Yes. Yes, okay, yes. what day and time do you know? 13th of um, March at, um, at the same time, the same time where we started. Okay, well, we will definitely share that one around um, and, and join you. That would be an interesting one. Hi, Lisa. Hi, hi, everybody. Hi, thank you guys for uh, doing this. It was beautiful. And I have a few things written down, Deva. A few books I'm going to read. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and so what about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross? Kubler Did she ever come? She never came through. She has never come, but that was fascinating what you said. So who knows now? Yeah. Yeah, watch out for her. Invite her in. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, I will. Yeah, hmm. yeah so it's 13th of March and um, at whatever time we just started the same. Which was uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, Lisa, anything you want to mention before we bring this to a close? Gosh, I think the books that uh, Deva mentioned were absolutely beautiful. My favorite is Journey of Souls. Billy Fingers is second. So Deva, we're right on. I just and there's a few I haven't read, so I'm excited to read them now. And I love the uh, the Sigmund. I can never pronounce the names right, but that Sigmund. one is absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So I I love those books, yeah. And the ones I haven't, I will I will certainly get to. The Osho one sounds fascinating. So that's on my list now. Well, we'll also ask our any participants today to read your book and then give us their feedback. Yes, I love that. Good. Well, Deva, it's been a real joy to have you talking about your books. It's nice to have a different kind of subject for a change, isn't it? Um, and uh, we've really enjoyed hearing about them. Thank you so much for creating this. I was really, and I'm happy I don't have to write because you first wanted to have a blurb one. I know, I know. We are inviting a few people who are really busy to come on and just yeah. talk about them, and then we'll put together the write up afterwards okay. based on uh, the things that you said. But um, yeah, um, I really want to encourage people to go to your website and, and look at your um, uh, Medicine of Mantra series, which you and I had a discussion about, I think, last year. And I love that series because I am so into the healing power of sound. Mm, yes, yes. Are you going to do any more? Uh, you know what? I was just a bit distracted because I saw a question. <laughs> Somebody say, is it next year because we are in... <laughs> In May, I think I said 13th of March. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I actually meant next week. I know it does just see it's May already. So 13th of May. Okay. So that'll be the 13th of May. Yeah. And um, I'll send out a reminder as well to people. Um, what day is the 13th? Is that the Wednesday? Yeah, yeah that. Wednesday, yeah. yeah, Wednesday. So on Monday, I usually send out a note to people about the um, the upcoming guests. So I'll make sure that people also uh, get a note uh, as a reminder to go on Wednesday to see, take part in your event with Lisa. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Thank you very much, Deva. We will have this edited and shared next week. So if you missed anything, if you want to rewatch it, it will be posted around on our Facebook pages, on the website. Um, it'll be all over the place, so you'll be able to find it. Uh, thank, thank you for you. being with us. And next week, we'll be back with uh, Yandla Van Zant, who actually couldn't complete the interview that she was going to do a few weeks ago because of technical hitches. So we're running that next week and it will be two hours later than normal. Mm. So uh, again, I'll send a note out about that. Thank you, Deva. Say hi to meeting. Yes, I'll pass it on. And all love to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye-bye.